Well, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here today. Thank you, Rachel, for that. It, uh, you know, starting to imagine a world where more and more of us go into space and go up into orbit and look down on the Earth. I mean, you can almost, you can almost picture this room and just take this room on a large space station. You know, we were talking about uh, Jerry O'Neill's, uh, you know, variation of Jerry O'Neill's cylinders last night. You know, imagine this room, this conference in space, you know, in 20, 30 years. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think we, we all maybe share some part of that vision. Uh, so I'm, I'm Sean McClinton. I run the Space Entrepreneurs Meetup here in Seattle. Uh, we have about 850 members, and we're uh, focused on the commercialization of space. So and that's uh, starting in Seattle. Um, so we're, we're professionals. We're focused on the industry of space. Uh, but what brought me to space was really space tourism. Uh, I looked for a way, a foray into the industry where I could use my skill set, which was non-engineering, and I met the head of sales for Virgin Galactic, and I met Erica Wagner at Blue Origin, and said, this is my skill set, how can I get involved, and, and it was really space tourism. But it wasn't until I came across the overview effect that it really clarified and crystallized why we're doing this. You know, wh why do we pick an industry that's so hard, you know, it's so complex and so expensive, um, and it was really the overview effect that that helped crystallize that for me to the point that I reached out to Frank on, on LinkedIn and said, hey, I was just blown away by your book. I'd love to you know, talk to you about it. And he was gracious enough to, to spend, spend some time with me to, to talk about it. And actually, that was three or four years ago. And we've been talking um, about monthly ever since. So I've gotten to know Frank. And um, I think you know, Rachel and I, like you can see how profoundly, and we haven't even been to space. And look how profoundly it's affected us. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't read the overview effect, to, to grab a copy. There's a new edition coming out. Uh, Frank just went to Houston to interview uh, a few astronauts who are actually on the ISS. So he, he hadn't done that before. There's a number of astronaut interviews in the book. And so a uh, new edition coming out, I think, you know, in a year or so. Um, so let me just take a quick poll in the audience. Who wants to go to space? I have to look for people who aren't raising their hands. And, you know. Kalio, somebody kept his hand up for, for even longer, so e even more enthusiastic. Um, so again, my, my honor to be here. Um, I thought I would set the, the tone for this upcoming panel with um, a, a short video. It's the overview video, which is based on the overview effect. Um, so I want you, while you're watching this, pretend you, you are floating uh, weightless in a, in a space station, and, and let's, uh, let's, get all, let, let's pretend if we're not in space now that we, um, that we will be soon. So if you could cue up the video. Golly, I remember going through launch, which is an overwhelming experience. The engines cut off. I felt myself floating out of the seat. I floated over to the window, looked out, and we were coming up over the coast of Africa. And that's when it hit me. Uh, I'm in space. And, you know, I just got incredibly excited because it's something I had dreamed about since I was six years old. I think you start out with this idea of what it's going to be like. And then when you do finally look at the Earth for the first time, you're overwhelmed by how much more beautiful it really is when you see it for real. It's just like it's this dynamic, alive place that you see glowing all the time. It was truly incredible to be up there um, doing what I always wanted to do my whole life and then to kind of glance back at our planet and uh, see that view was just tremendous. I can only describe what I've seen. You know, looking down at the Earth and you see that that line that separates day into night slowly moving across the planet. Thunderstorms on the horizon casting these long shadows as the sun sets. And then watching the Earth come alive and you see the lights from the cities and the towns. 
The events you see from space, like flying over thunderstorms, looking at them from the top, were spectacular. Like a fireworks show going on, and you're looking at it from the very top. You know, shooting stars going below us, or, or you know, dancing curtains of auroras. It's just um, very hard to describe all the, you know, the colors, the beauty, the, the motion. My job as lunar module pilot was to be responsible for the lunar module itself and responsible for the science on the moon. So uh, when we started home, I had a little more time to look out the window than the other guys because most of my responsibilities were completed. We were uh, in a particular mode called the barbecue mode. So we were flying like this and rotating like that. What that caused to happen was every two minutes, a picture of the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, and a 360 degree panorama of the heavens appeared in the spacecraft window. And I had studied um, astronomy and I had studied cosmology and fully understood that uh, the molecules in my body and the molecules in my partner's bodies and in the spacecraft had been prototyped in some ancient generation of stars. In other words, it was pretty obvious uh, from those descriptions, we're stardust. Well, that was pretty awesome and powerful, particularly since uh, I had a little more time at this point to be uh, reflective and to think about it. Awe, I think, is one of those words that you um, have a better understanding of once you see it, too. I felt like you know, using the word awesome was totally appropriate when it came to describing what the planet looks like. To have that experience of awe is, at least for the moment, to let go of yourself, to transcend the sense of separation. So it's not just that they were experiencing something other than them, but that they were at some very deep level integrating, realizing their interconnectedness with that beautiful blue-green ball. And this is why the astronauts, particularly in the International Space Station, often say that much of their free time is filled with what they call Earth-gazing, just staring out at the Earth. They so that, that video is about 20 minutes long, and I know it's engaging, and I think we'd all like to put our feet up and keep watching it, but. Uh, because we have such a great panel and I think a, a great discussion uh, coming up, I'd like to, to move on to that. But that video was free to watch on Vimeo, so just Vimeo overview effect, and this is 20 minutes. So um, let's see. I'd like to go ahead and invite the panelists up here, uh, Amrish, Lynette, and, and Rachel. We can give them a hand. And, and by the way, I did talk to Frank White uh, before this, and he wishes he could be here, but, but he just said it's, it's so exciting. You know, when he wrote the book in the first edition in 86, to kind of modest uh, success, uh, he had no idea that, that that would turn into this and some of the amazing research um, some of these panelists are doing. So uh, it's my honor to be able to uh, moderate this panel. And i um, like to start by introducing Lynette Shaw, fellow and the Michigan Society of Fellows and Assistant Professor of Complex Systems at the University of Michigan. Okay. They come up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, word for word. So, uh, Lynette, if you would, if you'd come up and say a few words. Hello. Is this on? Okay. Uh, thank you all for having me here today. This is outside my normal wheelhouse, but I'm very excited to get to talk about uh, the overview effect as it relates to cultural processes. Um, so. Uh, my area of specialties is actually the emergence of sociocultural dynamics from individual processes and behaviors. So um, specifically, I think I'm here today to talk about the micro to macro transition that tends to be very difficult to conceptualize in systems generally, not just social systems, but especially social systems. Um, I've saved you all the jargony slides that I usually have, um, and I'm just going to talk about that. So um, my particular area of specialty is within the modeling of, um, so just to give you some background, my PhD is in sociology, but my undergraduate is in uh, physics. So it's a very, I'm um, working at the intersection of um, systems modeling and uh, social processes. 
So my area of specialties is actually social construction. So for those of you who are not familiar with that term, uh, I like to use the Thomas theorem. It's the closest thing that sociology has to theorems. And it basically states that if men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. So this is often applied uh, most uh, frequently to concepts of, for instance, race and gender. Uh, but there are a lot of different arenas with a lot of real impact that um, it comes up. So for instance, uh, part of my work has actually been in the social construction of economic value around money. So why is it that something is regarded as having economic value? And, and if this seems like a bit of an abstract kind of philosophical question, my particular area of research has been in cryptocurrency. So how was it over the past decade, in spite of a lack of state backing or commodity backing, this thing became defined as real? My other body of work, however, which is going to relate much more directly to the panel today, is in cognition and culture. Uh, specifically, I look at how implicit processes of sense making, how emotional kind of system one, if you're familiar with behavioral economics, end up aggregating into cultural dynamics and how those affect cultural processes of change. Okay, so um, this is a surprisingly under theorized area uh, for our understanding of social systems. We're just now getting into this. And a lot of this has to do with what the moral psychologist Jonathan Haidt refers to as the rationalist delusion. So the rationalist delusion basically refers to a tendency in Western thinking to overprivilege uh, what's happening in individuals that is consciously available to them. So think of your standard rational actor who's making an economic decision. We like to think of ourselves as being a uh, very rational and these emotional things, these automatic sense making, not so important. Um, however, um, at both the individual level and the collective level, we know that it's very, very wrong at this point. So at the individual level, there's been something known as the cognitive science revolution, which has started getting into the uh, brass tacks of how we make decisions in the world, how we understand things. Uh, also the field of behavioral economics is specifically predicated on this. So the basic metaphor used there is that of an elephant and a rider. So if the rider is our conscious awareness that's sitting on top of an elephant, the elephant is all these automatic sense-making, emotionally loaded uh, aspects to what we experience. And essentially, you know, if the elephant is going along as expected, the rider can direct it. But when the elephant feels something, it will take individuals wherever it wants to go. Um, so we know that at the individual level, we also are seeing at the collective level how much these other aspects to our understanding and experience matter for cultural dynamics. And just, I'm going to point to, for instance, nationalism. So nationalism, fake news, um, extremism in all stripes. These are all processes which have a huge component of um, emotionality and automatic sense making wrapped up with them. And what we're finding, um, you know, both in our society and academically right now is that these processes matter for the explanation of what mobilizes populations. What gets people motivated? What, what structures their understanding of not just what's important, but what's possible, okay? So at this time, you might have noticed in our species history, we have a very unique set of challenges in front of us. So one of this comes in the, in the face of at this point in time, we have a collision rate of social realities that has never been seen before. So uh, we kind of ran out of room on the planet, and now we're forced to interact with one another. So it's a constant uh, stream of different social groups, different social realities hitting one another, and that can cause a lot of friction, as you might have noticed. Simultaneously, we also now have global threats such as climate change, which are things that we need to be able to collectively mobilize upon. And so it's in that context that I just want to talk about the significance of the overview effect and why it is that these efforts to make it more accessible are so important right now. So modernity has come with a lot of a, um, a cessation of common shared profound experiences. So historically, you can think about humans as a species, um, you know, part of what constitutes our sensation of us are having meaningful experiences in common to have a common, of common focal point we can all point to and say, this matters, this is us. It is very important for the definition of in-group, out-group. Right now, with the diversity of experiences going on the planet, different value systems, et cetera, it's very difficult to get us all together, to get us all 
on a common understanding of what we are. So what I see in the overview effect, and I've talked to Rachel about this uh, a fair bit, bringing this experience to the population, not just one group, but across the population, has a huge potential right now. It's essentially a raw material for the constitution of a new sensation of what us is, for a meta identity that can both handle the particularities of what we are in our groups, but also allow us to have a pointer to a common understanding of what we are. It's a new thing for our species. We've never had to develop it, but I would argue that is absolutely necessary at this point in time. So I, I just wanna predicate this all because I think sometimes when we have these conversations, it can feel a little bit like uh, John Lennon-ish sort of uh, dreamer, but I really wanna emphasize that this is not just a nice feeling. This is the raw material for something that is very critically important right now and has a potential a lot of power potentially a lot of power that's proportionate to the diversity of individuals you get to experience. So in closing, I'm just going to mention a little bit very quickly. So uh, Carl Sagan was my first crush. Uh, definitely <laughs> via uh, my grandfather on VHS tape taped the original Cosmos series. I watched it so much that I wore out the tape. Okay. That sensation of awe and connection is what we're talking about here. Um, it motivated me in my own life to the work I am now. It's probably motivated one of a lot of you. So if, imagine that being a ubiquitous sensation within the population. What sort of things can we get done? And just to close, uh, I, in the many times I've read Contact by Sagan, there's one line um, where the aliens, you know, the other species are talking to Ellie, and they mention to her that they're pretty naive, but they're getting there on physical technology, but they're just barely starting out on understanding how the social world works. So I think right now, this is an important topic. We need to be talking about this. We need every bit we can get help on, and we're very lucky to have people like this working on this project. Thank you. Uh, so we've kind of set the stage here. I'm actually gonna skip intros for Rachel and Amresh because I think everybody heard from Rachel, and, and so um, we'll, We'll save that. Um, Amresh will actually be giving a demo at the end of our Q&A discussion. So, so Amresh, Amresh, if it's okay, I'll have you intro yourself at, at that time. Sounds so, good. Okay. Right. okay, so uh, for this panel discussion, um, again, hoping to kind of dive into why are we doing this and what does it mean? And so um, I think we have, we have context now. So I thought I would start with the overview effect in the individual. Um, you know, we, we got a sense of what it means, you know, for some of the people who have been um, but uh, could each of you give some comments on, on, on your views on what it really means for the individual? Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then after that, I think we can move on to what it means for, for society as a whole. I'm going to start. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I, the way I would characterize this at the individual level, um, so in sociology, kind of it's understood that our sensation of, our understanding of ourselves is very rooted to our, the sense of the groups to which we belong. So I would say overview effect is probably, you know, in some ways the closest we have to a modern religious experience in terms of being able to contextualize ourselves uh, and what we are. Um, and I would say that at the individual level, I do see it at the basis of kind of a, that meta identity, that understanding of self as part of a collective precious whole. And um, you know, I don't think there's anything else really comparable to that other than uh, in the history of humanity, other than religious experience. <clears throat> yeah, um, and then I'll take it from there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so it makes me think about a there's like this this pyramid where at the bottom it's there's it, it's um, all different levels of self, and at the bottom it's individual, and then it goes up to familial, and then tribal. Um, all the way up to planetary or universal. And um, we have all these identities that keep us separate from our environment and from other people. Um, and so the overview effect for me is something that, like, just like what you're saying, is then expands that identity to make it so that it's something that we all share. It's something that actually makes you understand that this is all one humanity. And, and that is then part of your identity. Yeah, the very quick thing I would add is exactly that. Just the concept of the overview effect 
breaks down that distinction between individual and collective. And so it's almost a um, somewhat of a misnomer on how people have viewed this in an individual sense and a collective sense, because once people witness or experience or truly begin to understand the concept of the cognitive shift that happens mm -hmm. during an overview effect type scenario, um, you automatically go towards a collective mindset versus me, myself, and I. Absolutely. That's great. Um, so, Rachel, you mentioned, I think, 571 people have been in the space, or mm -hmm. approximately. Approximately. And, and how that data set is fairly homogenous. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I recall in the early days of the shuttle, um, they were talking about um, their citizens in space program, you know, and musicians and writers and, you know, people from all walks of life uh, could, could start to think about, you know, what if we could go to space? Mm -hmm. And then Challenger happened, and that, that dream kind of died for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but as we look at people from different backgrounds and different walks of life also being able to experience the overview effect, how, how does each individual from a different background, do they experience the overview effect differently, or do we all experience mm -hmm. it the same, or um, yeah. what, what's your viewpoint on that? Um, so I, I was touching on it before, and I don't know if I articulated it well, um, but the overview effect it can be considered a, there's a lot of different terms for these types of experiences that really open your mind and, and shift your worldview. Um, and I touched on something called quantum change. And then there's also, you could also call it a transcendental experience. Um, there's a lot of different terms for it. And it's interesting because they can come across in so many different ways. I know people who have done it through um, different types of religious experiences or through meditation or just through like I watched a documentary and my life was changed um, But the commonalities behind all of these experiences that then make your worldview bigger and make you actually feel connected to people are Are all shared so it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from But the um, the traits that go with this experience are common And there's been studies that prove that Lynette, anything from your research that, that shows? So uh, I will say, yeah, so, um, you know, the, the kind of structure of uh, these big experiences. So uh, there's actually a classic sociologist, Durkheim, who talks about uh, collective effervescence, right? So usually you have to have a big group together in one place, and then you have a sensation of transcending your own individuality, and it kind of is a constitution of what's valuable, what's sacred, what's important, right? Um, so something like the overview effect, I think, is especially powerful because um, you know you don't have to you don't have to subscribe to a particular cosmology or set of beliefs to have it. Right? It is a way to kind of get that profundity of experience that we can all connect to um, without having to be part and parcel of a particular way of thinking or a particular tradition of thought. And I will say that like I'm very excited to have that common experience be refracted back through different lenses. So I think that's where the beauty of it comes from. The experience is a common one, but the way that it gets rearticulated and refracted back into the rest of society mm -hmm. has a huge amount of potential. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so we've talked about the individual. It's an interesting distinction where, you know, I, in my mind I thought individual and society, but it sounds like you know, the distinction and, and, and how that transition happens is, is a clear part of the process yeah. of the overview effect. And so, you know, if we've had 571 people go, a lot of the, you know, anecdotal, the, the feedback has been individual. Mm -hmm. Do we have any collective data on those 571 people? Is, mm -hmm. is it too small of a group to show, mm -hmm. you know, my next question was related to society. And, you know, for example, if this whole room had had the experience, yeah. you know, what would it, how would it change our yeah. conversations and our, you know, uh, um, you know, just curious if you have any insight there. Um, I, I do, and, and I'm actually kind of still thinking about the last question, um, but it, in, it's related. But it's interesting, so of those 570 people, each of them have their own, yes, it is like a small subset of the population, and they all still have their own backgrounds. And so depending on their background, that, that would impact the way they take in the experience and what, and what they experience. And so, like, for example, Edgar Mitchell had a very religious background. And so for him, it was an intensely spiritual experience. And then there's other people who are just like hardcore scientists and engineers and don't have that at all. And for them, that's not how it occurs to them. 
Um, and so, d so like you're saying, depending on your background, it completely changes the way that you take in the experience. And then um, that also goes into why, for, for me and for Space for Humanity, it's important that each person creates their own, their own project when they return mm -hmm. that's an expression of themselves, yep. because who knows what the overview yep. effect could mean for them. Yep. When we do the demo in a few minutes, I'll bring up an, an, an anecdote, but I always love to kind of see what, uh, how kids react mm -hmm. to the concept of the overview effect. And so most of you probably have heard this quote from uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but he basically said that kids are the world's best scientists mm -hmm. because they have no inherent biases that have clouded their mind, no pre preconceived notions. They're essentially uh, sponges that have this burning desire of intellectual curiosity without preconceived silos or biases and prejudices, and the list goes on. And so the reaction when I show uh, this demo to kids is very, very uh, homogenous in mm -hmm. a way. It's awe-inspiring, it expands their minds a bit, and they tend to brainstorm and imagine what's possible as a collective versus mm -hmm. an individual. And I'll get into that when we do the demo. That's awesome. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I am very interested in what would happen collectively if this was even, if even a fraction of the population larger had this experience. And the reason for that is because um, experiences like this, especially when they're shared, um, have, uh, they, re, they basically reform value systems. Mm -hmm essentially. So, um, and you see this at the individual level, like uh, framing effects, for instance, and in economic games, right? But moral systems, describing what is important, the weight we put on what is important, what is possible, changes by virtue of things like this. And to have an experience of the plan of participating in a planetary society, to have a sensation of identity which is linked to a species in it, the precariousness thereof, has a huge revolutionary potential, in my opinion, in terms of b providing the individual basis for collective mobilization around the sorts of planetary problems that we're currently facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, it's, it, that just makes me think of the Anusha Ansari quote that I use in my talk, and she says, peace on Earth, no problem. Yeah. Like, it makes all of the problems yeah, that we're facing does. seem like Oh, it, we, we can yeah. do this. You can, uh, you can essentially understand it as a shift in salience, mm -hmm. right? Like every day we're out there making decisions, which aspect of our identity is most salient at that time is going to drive the decisions that we make. So, yeah. See, so all of this, I, I think, you know, as we see launch costs falling, you know, I, that to me, this is a key driver of why we do this. And so it's, it's pretty exciting to see, like, this is what we're working for, but this is what, you know, this is what we might be able to to accomplish, you know, mm -hmm. by, by working at this. So, uh, so I've, I've two more questions, and we'll get to Amrush's demo. Um, <clears throat> in Frank's book, uh, he talks about the technological overview effect, uh, and so that's uh, how technology has helped us experience kind of a facsimile of the overview effect. Mm -hmm. So, if satellites are our eyes and satellite antennas are our, are our ears, you know, um, are there any similarities? Um, I think you've spoken to this a little bit, you know, in, in some of your presentations. But, you know, just curious, like, how does technology compare to the human experience, and 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 what kind of results are we seeing? Um, yeah, well, uh, the VR experience. Uh, so mm -hmm. <laughs> right, starting there. It's, it's um, nothing is going to be the same as actually going to space, of course. But um, as proponents of this concept. I think we, it's kind of uh, our, the onus is on us to bring this experience and this concept to as many people as we can because it has a transformative effect. It's a, it's a collective effect. And so one of the reasons why we developed uh, Mission ISS was to help bring the concept of the overview effect to thousands, hopefully millions of people. And there are many other technology analogs that Frank White was talking about or, or facsimiles of, of analogs, if you will. And uh, satellites have helped us do that. Other technologies have helped us do that. Um, the ability to bring up imagery at a moment's notice on your cell phone as well has, mm -hmm. has helped democratize kind of access to the concept of the, uh, of the overview effect. So these are all good things. Um, and I think the, we're beginning to explore the 
other analogs as well that become even more real and uh, help make that transition for people on what that cognitive effect may be, the overview effect. Yeah. No. <laughs> You're the expert. Right. No. No. So, so that seems to be a midway point between where we are now and, and having more and more people go, you know, yeah. things like VR and, and um, technology where if you're, you know, we, we look at Google Maps every day, right, which is actually a geostationary image of the planet or approximately, you know, uh, and, and all these, you know, technologies that space has brought us and the perspective, you know, and the similarities to the perspective that, but I, I agree with you, Amr, mm -hmm. that, that it can't replace the human experience mm -hmm. aspect of it. So uh, last question for each of you, uh, you know, with all the thinking and work you've done around the overview effect, how do you think it would change you personally if you went? What do you think about when you when you see yourself up there and doing and thinking? And how it would affect your research? Oh man, um, it's hard. To, it's hard to know. Um, I just I think if I, I'm just picturing myself like being on the International Space Station <laughs> and looking out over the cupola, and um, I think it would just bring tears to my eyes and. I think, yeah, I, w I would just get lost up there. Mm -hmm. I don't, and I don't know how it would change me, but it would be amazing. Mm -hmm. And I definitely want to do it. Um, and one, one anecdote that I always like to share is um, at Space Vision, the SETS conference, uh, two or three years ago, Nicole Stott, who's an astronaut, spoke. And she was talking about her experiences in the cupola. And she said that when she used to go into the cupola, which is this 360 degree view window of the Earth from the International Space Station, um, she would have to set a timer because otherwise she would just get lost when she was up there. <laughs> I'd just completely lose track of time. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what it would be like to be in space mm -hmm. and see Earth floating in space. <laughs> but I know it would be very, very cool. You'll have to find out someday. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm confident I will. <laughs> See you there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, referencing my aforementioned crush on Carl Sagan. <laughs> um, so I think that, I mean, uh, agreeing with Rachel, I'm pretty sure I could not actually completely conceive of that. I have enough sort of humility and study to know that. Yeah. Um, but what I, I do think that one of the most, what I would anticipate one of the biggest was, would be like a, a fulfillment of uh, hope or belief, right? So I think that, you know, I personally, by virtue of the work of Sagan and Druin and um, those other folks, I have had the benefit of feeling connected to this sort of sense of identity, this sense right there. I think actually getting to experience that would be a bit of a, a completion. I would imagine it's probably, it would probably be uh, the best experience of my life. Yeah. Right, the most important, mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I would anticipate that I would come back very humble and working even harder to make sure that we keep going. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, I'll answer part of that during the demo, mm -hmm. if that's okay. But I think the the common theme for me is that I would obviously I want to go, but I I think it's. Um, I would go only if, as long as, and any other uh, adjective before that or phrase before that, that it can inspire the next generation or impact others through education. Mm -hmm. And I've got to find, or we have to find, what that connection is. Mm -hmm. If I alone go, it doesn't really mean mm -hmm. a hell of a lot. Yeah. But if I can bring that experience mm -hmm. to <laughs> others exponentially and, you know, and spread that, that, that feeling, if you will, in any way that I can, then that would be more impactful. Awesome. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> we called Elon and tried to get a Falcon 9 here to, to bring everybody up <laughs> up to orbit. He said no this time, but 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 call him you know next time. But um, thankfully we've got an awesome demo that Amrush is, is going to show you that that will hopefully bring bring us all a little little closer to space. And then after that we'll do we'll do audience questions and and, and we'll wrap up. So sounds good. Here. How much time do we have? How much time do we have? I think we have 25 minutes. Okay. Do you know if our slide is up? No. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So um, I wanted to start this uh, demo by kind of giving you a quick glimpse on where it's been. And, uh, and I'll get into kind of the background of what this demo is as I already, as I put the headset on and while I'm in VR just to kind of save time. 
So as all of you know, 50 years ago, uh, Buzz was walking on the moon, and uh, we had the privilege of taking him back to space recently. Um, and he, is, he experienced what you'll be experiencing right now. And uh, he provided good feedback as well, but he truly enjoyed the experience, and we, um, we definitely valued his feedback. And it was, it was great to take a, a national hero, a national treasure, uh, virtually back to space and virtually back to experience the overview effect. Um, and Buzz rocked it. Uh, he, was, he was so proficient in all of the ISS and LEO tasks that we gave him virtually. So um, I'm confident that still, he still has the, the right stuff to go back okay. if, uh, if he chooses to. So um, hopefully this will work so far. If you guys, if you can switch over to my computer up here and we'll see if uh, this will work. And um, if you don't mind, if you don't, just make sure I don't fall off the back of the no. stage here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I gave this demo live at a conference in uh, Berlin. Um, and as I was doing it, I didn't notice where I was on stage. And I guess the audience folks there were so polite, no one said anything. <laughs> so I almost broke my neck. So hopefully today we'll, we'll be safe. So I, uh, for folks that don't know, I was uh, a, a team lead or project lead of some space-related content development at Oculus, uh, Facebook's VR company. And while I was there, we, our, our main project that we did was called Mission ISS, and that's what I'm going to show you today. Um, I can talk to folks afterwards on what the best way is to get this. Uh, it's freely available on the Oculus store, but you just need an Oculus headset. And there's various types of headsets you can get, um, all available kind of on oculus.com. So let me go ahead and start this up. It'll take a few seconds to load. But as it does, I'll give you more of a background. So this was done a couple years ago. There have been a couple updates since. Um, and it was primarily developed for educational purposes and also to demonstrate the overview effect. So um, as soon as this loads, I'll kind of get into more of the background. It was a team of quite a few people, about 40 or 50 people that um, I'll show you in a second, just to give them a little bit of recognition as well. And uh, the concept, once again, is a simulation of the ISS with a focus on uh, the view of Earth from LEO in order, to do, in order to showcase the overview effect. So here we go. So I'm going to take a few minutes. Please select training, mission, or explorer mode. I'm going to take a few minutes and show you the inside of the ISS. And then we're going to do an EVA and uh, experience the overview effect as much as we can. So the, the team that developed this um, was a team at Oculus and a development team in Los Angeles called Magnopus. We also had audio engineers at a company called Formosa. So it was a large team that put this together. And uh, we also had about 15 astronauts that gave us guidance and feedback along the way. Uh, and it was a truly global effort. We had astronauts from NASA, from ESA, from JAXA. Uh, and we also had several entities, NASA, ESA, and SpaceX, and others that helped, including the Canadian agencies um, as well. So the Canada arm and other CSA aspects are in this demo. So with that, let's jump in to the ISS. So here we are. And uh, the physics of this, exper this experience was, like I said before, um, found, uh, the astronauts helped us develop the, the physics of it. So you can see that I can grab onto grab bars like this and move myself around and move through the ISS just like an astronaut would. And uh, it is quite immersive. I mean, it, since you're seeing it on the screen, it may not look that immersive, but I'm, it feels like for me that I'm slightly weightless right now. You can 
so if I trip and fall, uh, it's part of the show. So you can pick up objects. Each object in the ISS we kind of modeled with correct physics. I always liked having uh, food fights on the ISS, so you can throw objects like that. And uh, the entire ISS is modeled, except for the, the Russian modules. Um, we weren't able to get permission, but maybe in the next version we may. And so one thing I'm going to show you, obviously, is the people. So let's go for that. The Earth model below us is a is a real Earth model. So let me flip this over. And hopefully you guys can still see it. Is everything working okay? All right, good. So um, as Rachel said, uh, one of the astronauts spends countless amounts of time here. So do I, actually, virtually. So I spent quite a few hours here myself. Um, I'm going to show you a couple quick things that I think are fun to see, and then we're going to go on an EVA. So we, we modeled a few things in this experience. One, you can see everything is semi-true to life. Um, we have the actual laptops that are on the ISS. We have the uh, remote manipulator system that drives the Canada arm, which I'm going to show you in a second. Um, and we had quite a few astronauts help us, or at least NASA did, in granting us access to some videos in select places of the ISS. So let me show you that real fast. Um, why don't we take a look at the $30 million toilet. Here we go. Here we are. And so Sunny Williams helped us out quite This is awesome. You might see the little, um, you might have noticed the little moon on the outside. This is our orbital outhouse right here. And so uh, there's about 20 or 30 different locations in the ISS where astronauts actually have videos from that actual location in space. Um, and then NASA gave us permission to use that. This is the, uh, the treadmill, of course. So let's do two things really fast. Let's go ahead and go back to the cupola. And I'll show you the first few segments of docking a Dragon capsule, which SpaceX was kind enough to allow us permission to use Dragon capsule. So uh, never leave home uh, without your trusty iPad in space. So let's do that. And then uh, as soon as I do this, I'll take you outside to, uh, so that collectively we can experience the overview effect together. Approach the controls and we'll guide you through the procedure. Now that you're at the controls, you'll see monitors showing the view from your external cameras. The joysticks in front of you will control the remote manipulator system, or RMS, which is the main robotic arm. The RMS is attached to a platform called the Mobile Base System, or MBS. The translational joystick can so move straight in right any there. direction. In and there's out, the right left there. and right, up and down. And, uh, you should be able to see both the capsule and the capture port on two monitors. These are the Try moving the joysticks and, and see how the robotic arm responds. And it's definitely uh, not easy. This was modeled As long as you proceed slowly, accurate. things should be fine. You'll need and to line so up the latching end of the arm to the capsule docking port. It was intended once to be you're connected, uh, initiate like capture. Accurate. You should see so the docking port easy. highlighted on the capsule but above you. Move the arm to capture position kind of a and lock onto the port. On what astronauts would have to do. Right now, this is all fully automated, but several astronauts do train for this in case there's a anomaly on the ISS. But I'm not going to go through the entire process here, but Looking I'll show you at the air or the monitor that the cannon arm can dock to the docking point on the Dragon. And then, if I get this right, I'll try not to... ISS, uh, uh, please don't jeopardize a $100 million supply mission. Right, I'll try not to... <laughs> I'll try not to destroy the Dragon capsule here. That'd be a bad marketing mumbo jumbo for SpaceX. There we go. All right, capsule lock is confirmed. The next step is to move Let's the capsule into position at the ISS hat. So let's go outside, what do you say? All right. Okay, so I wanted to show you the outside because it's based on an actual accurate, um, accurate model of Earth. So let's say bye to the cupola. And I'll go ahead and flip this around. And it's not easy to navigate in the ISS, so bear with me here. There we go. And I have a funny story to share with you. One of the 15 astronauts that helped us out, Michel Remain Nameless, uh, when he went up in 06 or 07, 
Um, he got lost in a particular area of the ISS, right outside the Kibo module over there. Um, in fact, I'll give you a time instead. All right, thanks. Uh, so, there's a particular astronaut that got lost on the ISS when he went up, and it was around this region, and he was a little disoriented, um, kind of in a position like this, and didn't know which way to go. And surprisingly enough, when he helped us out with our simulation, he got lost in the same exact spot. <laughs> and I'm not gonna tell you who that is, because there are reporters in the room. So here we go. Let's go back to, um, our, that other one. Let's go do an EVA. Okay. We have several videos that talk about how to put on uh, an EVA spacesuit, but we're going to skip that. And for the sake of time, in fact, before we do the EVA, like, like I said before, I wanted to at least recognize the, the large team that put this together, because it was quite an effort. So let me quickly do that. And to show you really fast, we had a very large team. We had a team at Oculus, can anyone, everyone see that? We had a very large team at Oculus that were kind of the program managers. Hopefully that's clear. We had a very large team at Agnopus that had essentially developed and coded this experience. We had audio engineers as well. And so quite a few folks were behind this effort, all towards the, the, the unifying goal of education, bringing this concept of the ISS and the overview effect to to hopefully millions of people. That's why it's freely available on the uh, on the audio store. So let's go outside. All right, let's begin. So let's go ahead and, uh, as you know, uh, those who are familiar with kind of the EVA protocols, um, we're usually tethered, and it's kind of a hand over hand uh, type movement, like this, to go around the ISS. But you know what? We're in a simulation, so let's be a little risky. We're gonna experience uh, Leo and the overview effect without being tethered. So this is, um, let's make sure we don't get a solar panel. Okay, here we go. So yeah, so this is a, this is a real Earth model that we used, and it does rotate um, as well. So if we stay out here long enough, we'll be seeing the majority of the Earth. Um, I'm using my safer pack now, and uh, this view that I have shown to hundreds of students in various schools um, around the country. ISS, this is Mission Control at Johnson. ISS, if you're going to keep going in that direction, you might want to put a re-entry vehicle around here first. Better come on back. <laughs> um, I want to show you one quick thing. I was going to say that we. This view is their favorite part of the simulation. And it's had one comment that kind of stuck with me over the last couple of years. And it was a five-year-old girl in first grade that we went a little further out there and saw the, the view from her. And she basically said, and I'm trying to paraphrase here a bit, that, oh, wow, what a spectacular view. We are all on a blue, round spaceship. With an emphasis on the word all. We are all on a blue. You've gone too far from the station. Should we go over and show you a, uh, a quick sport that I like to do before we end this demo? And this sport is not a NASA approved EVA sport. I call it solar panel surfing. Um, once again, not NASA approved. So um, let's go back to the overview effect. So the, uh, the one, the, the comments that kids give me when I show them this is what kind of really strikes me and at its core. But once again, I told you what Russ Tyson is saying about kids being kind of the unbiased, um, without prejudice scientists out there. And by the way, a uh, real star map with me. But um, 
that really struck home with me. And I always like to say that we, all humans, have some inherent strand within our DNA, or strands, plural, that code for this type of intellectual curiosity, where we find this, like Rachel said, awe-inspiring. And we all have that. In some of us, it kind of burns brighter. In some of us, it may be slightly dormant, just needs to be awakened through a catalyst, if you will. But we are all encoded to have that within us. And that's what took a few kids to kind of help me recognize why we did this. And so, and once again, it goes to back to what that six-year-old told me, and it kind of brings it all home, that we're, we're all at the DNA level, 99.9, .9, and many nines more the same. We all have that inherent desire to, for intellectual curiosity. So regardless of our gender, sexual orientation, religion, ethnicity, whether we're vegan or carnivore, short or tall, what country we come from, and the list goes on and on, um, this experience is the same. What it means to us is exactly the same. And it, it helps us think through what the collective... Be careful not to venture too far from the station. Thanks for interrupting me, guys. So um, I'd love to show this to as many folks as I can as I can. So I'll uh, if you want to come by and I'll, I'll tell everyone where I'll set this up. Um, I wanted to say one last thing, and I think I forgot what that was. But um, yeah, with that, why don't I end? And we're I think Sean will take some questions. Yeah. Cool. That was awesome. Thanks, Amrish. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, audience question. I think we have time for a few. I think we have a, a roaming mic. Anyone? Yeah, hey. Hi. So I don't really have a comment. I have more of like maybe a small story that will echo, echo the sentiments that Rachel and the rest of the panel have brought up. So Talil was up here before from Dubai. Uh, we happened to do some business with some executives uh, from DIWA, which is the Dubai Electric and Water Authority. And they came over to um, where we were, and we were doing some factory acceptance testing. And we went out to lunch, and they started talking about the political and religious and ideological differences between the West and where they are a part of the world. And then I tried to explain to them, like, look, let's forget about all that. Uh, we live, we all live not just on Earth, we live on a small blue band of air, which is basically all life in the universe that we have is basically 10 miles, mm -hmm. basically, and that's it. So it doesn't matter what I believe or you believe or what our politics are, what race or religion that we are, we're all the same and that's the important thing. And I remember they were looking at me just like completely taken aback and that message was starting to resonate with them. And I think everyone in this room has sort of the same perception, and that's why we're in this industry, and that's why we're we're just trying to move forward. So, just wanted to share that that story with everyone. So, thank you. It. Thank that's you. Great. Okay. Hi. Okay. I'm Mike Doyle. I um, help organize NASA's Space Apps Challenge Hackathon for Seattle, and. Uh, I actually tried Mission ISS at Space Apps in Seattle uh, last year, and it was amazing. <laughs> totally breathtaking. Even the second time that I put it, put the headset on and went through it, literally I gasped when I saw the Earth below me. Um, Space Apps was uh, kind of a brainchild of Ron Garin, who wrote the Orbital Perspective, and his experience was one of the drivers that um, led to a uh, worldwide hackathon where uh, tens of thousands of people um, use NASA data to advance um, missions in space and improve life on Earth. I guess as uh, this panel is thinking about getting that orbital perspective, that overview effect into the hands of more people, what do you expect the world, to, how do you expect the world to change? What, have you thought about concrete things that uh, you would see as the first fruits from that experience? I, 
I can start. So I uh, so you mentioned you mentioned that we all in this room have self selected essentially into a um, very difficult arena of human endeavor, but it's a powerful motivating force, right? So um, I think that some like again going I, I promise I'll stop fangirling about Sagan one day, but I mean. <laughs> That for me was fundamental in where I decided to put my energy and effort in the world. It was fundamental through honestly getting me through a lot of hard stuff growing up. It was something that kept me going and finding others who share that also moves. So I think that um, Rachel's talked about like kind of the you know space for humanity, the component about going back to the community, bringing them in. I feel like this is a huge potential essentially to you know we, we we're privileged to be able to be here like a lot of things had to go right in my life to be able to be here the more we have that out in the population I think the more that there's going to be a concrete effort to um, you know recognize at a local level your connection to these global problems and a kind of new renewed sense of responsibility and urgency around those and I would um, I don't know if that's concrete enough. I'm an, ab <laughs> I'm an abstract thinker, but um, I would start there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so there, I mentioned those studies that specifically look at individuals and how it's impacted individuals and how um, there are studies that show that there's, um, these types of experiences can give someone a sense of, of peace and well-being for decades or um, a sense of purpose that they've never had before. Um, and, and of course, there's also, there can be negative impacts as well. Um, I know that there's been astronauts who come back down and struggle with depression and um, just when you see the, after having that perspective and then seeing the current state of the world, um, that must be very sobering. Um, but that's also why I wanted, I think having Lynette here is really important yeah. because studying complex systems and studying um, society as a whole, mm -hmm. Like I said, there's been studies about an, the, the impact on individuals, but I haven't found, and, and it's very little, yeah. very little studies. Um, I haven't found anything on the impact that it could be on society as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fascinating, and I think it's really, really important. So I'll say real quick, uh, that uh, that's why I wanted to reference. Uh, so if anybody hasn't read The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt, I would strongly recommend it. It talks about essentially the, bra like the raw material of political mobilization, the raw material of collective action. And it is the exact same thing we're talking about with the overview effect. These are these big transcendent experiences that go outside uh, your current understanding of self. They reconfigure your worldview. Mm -hmm. right? And a lot of times those are, get manufactured and manipulated for ends that are not seemly, we'll just put it that way. But to have something real and tangible that can also be brought out and unify people of all different stripes, it, it's special. Mm -hmm. It's special and it has a potentially large impact for mobilization and collective uh, change. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, hopefully, hopefully this is a quick question, Michael Bloxton. Pricing, now, a few years from now, a few more years from now, to have a physical experience. What are you guys thinking and seeing? Um, what do you mean by physical experience? Like having people physically go to space? You're talking about the, the price point yep. of the experience? Yeah. So I might be able to, to, yeah. to take that. Um, <clears throat> so I think right now, I think we're about the $50 million price point, right? Um, and I think that price point was at the $10,000 a pound or $10,000 a kilo, um, you know, place. Uh, and I think we've heard kind of um, order of magnitude decrease in price, which would be $100 a pound. And so if you're talking about a 200, 200 pound person, is that, is that 200 grand or is that 20 grand? Um, I think it's 20 grand. Anyway, um, basically, you know, there's a, a, there's a bunch of other costs associated with launch, right? Um, but, but as I see it, if you can get that down to that, you know, for example, uh, an around the world trip on a private jet would be about $75,000 a person. You know, um, I think you've got to get it much lower than that. But you know, if you can bring it down by a couple orders of magnitude, um, obviously suborbital, two fifty to three hundred thousand dollars dollars a person right now. Um, you know, we can see that fall. At, you know, part of it will determine how much demand there is and 
and where the prices go. But um, you know, if you get down to a comparable family vacation of ten thousand dollars or five thousand um, dollars, you know that that personally, that's what I would like to see, where where you can get it to that price point where everybody could spend a week in orbit. I don't think. You know, suborbital was a great start for you know a few minutes of weightlessness and the, to see the curvature of the Earth and have the overview effect experience. But really, going and spending time there um, at an affordable price point um, will be will be critical. Uh, hi, Luke Maloney. This is a bit of a, a weird question, mostly for Lynette, because there's a particular internet religion that fascinates me, which is the flat Earth movement. Yeah. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm wondering if you, like, if you could comment, but how is that possibly real? And also, is that something of the opposite of the overview effect? Of the, uh, under yeah. effect or something? Yeah, so, uh, so um, just to, there's a big stop sign, but I'm going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I assume there's a fair bit of familiarity with machine learning in the audience or just some basic concepts. So if you take the data that you have and overtrain, to something, so this is like the echo chamber sort of effect, et cetera. You, and then you, you slap on confirmation bias, you basically have an overfitting on weird stuff, right? And then people kind of mutually confirm each other, and then they essentially get locked, they, you get locked into a particular perception, and you have an explain away functionality. So we can talk about the cognitive dynamics of that any sort of time. But that again is why I'm very excited about the vision that's been expressed up here is because as much as you want to um, tell yourself a story, having these sort of profound experiences that go beyond your local context. So essentially what we're dealing with here is a lot of people overfitting to local context and not and losing the ability to communicate across like outside of that context. And so you have that calcification or runaway confirmation process. Experiences like this create a new focal point where everybody can point to. Right. So, uh, but yeah, if anybody wants to talk about flat Earth society uh, afterwards, <laughs> I'm happy to talk about my feelings and opinion. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, I, I think we got the the stop sign, uh, but uh, I want to give the the panelists a round of applause for an awesome panel.